Good morning, everybody. Good to see all your smiling faces here today. And welcome to those who are watching online. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who feel alone and want community, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who worry and want peace, to all who sin and need a savior, to all who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and to whoever will come, this church offers her welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So welcome. Let's open in prayer. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we come to you again this morning. Thank you that you are the helper of the weak, the friend of sinners, the comforter of the afflicted. Thank you that your word is alive and can speak to us today. And we thank you, Lord, for just a gathering of people who love you and want to seek you. Uh, what a gift it is to be with brothers and sisters in the faith. So we pray that um, as we share this time, you would, um, you would do what you want to do in our church and through us for your glory. In your name, amen. amen. Would you take a moment during the prelude to quiet your heart <coughs> and to bring yourself uh, before God in worship. you to stand as we begin our worship with a call to worship from Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new 
to worship, don't we? And I love that just the rhythm of worshiping together helps me to worship and to say, Lord, you are good. It is worthwhile to sing your praises. Sing the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father. I cannot 
continue in worship as we receive the offering today and sing, We Give Thee But Thine Own. We give thee but thine own, whatever our gift may be, all that we have is thine alone, I trust O Lord from thee. Thank you that because of what you have given, uh, giving yourself on the cross, uh, we can give back uh, gifts to you. Thank you for our church that it's filled with servants who step up to serve when needed. Thank you for uh, the generosity of your people. We pray that as we uh, give to you, Lord, we would know your generous love among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Another, another <laughs> We're going to sing a, a hymn now together, number 355. There's a wideness in God's mercy. Beautiful words, difficult tune to sing. Mm. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in his justice, which is more than liberty. Mm. Amen. Well, on the fourth Sunday of the month for prayer, we've typically been uh, praying and focus, focusing on missions as we pray. So we've prayed for personal evangelism, we've prayed for uh, the Tejada family, we've prayed for local missions like Martha's Kitchen and Aspire Now, but I wanted to take some time this morning to pray for other local churches as we uphold one another in this common mission that we have uh, of proclaiming the gospel and loving people in Jesus' name. So... Um, I'm going to lift up several churches. These, this is not an exhaustive list of all the churches in Franklin County or our area, but churches with which we have some connection. Um, and so before we do that, though, I just want to invite us all to come into prayer in this prayer of confession, um, receiving God's mercy um, when we praying in line with the gospel that we believe. 
and then I'll lead us in prayer for uh, churches uh, that they would all live out God's mission. So let's take a moment and pray this prayer of confession together. That I believe is on the screen or will be on the screen. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may walk in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, we thank you so much that uh, we come together as people who are free in the gospel, who have no, uh, no shame can have power over us, no guilt. When we confess our sins to you and we trust in you, Thank you that there is a wideness in your mercy that is wider than the sea. Uh, Lord, we think of all the ways that we have uh, failed this week, mostly, I would say, by, uh, by not doing what we should do, by not loving you with our whole heart, by not loving our neighbors as ourselves. We earnestly long, Lord, to be... Um, to walk in a way worthy of our calling, and to love you more and to be more faithful. So we thank you for that mercy without which we are hopeless. We thank you for your transforming power at work in us. Lord, today we, uh, we lift up other churches besides our own, other churches that... Um, uh, we pray that they would uh, be fruitful, that their ministries would be blessed by you, um, that they would uh, fulfill their part of the great commission that you have you've entrusted to your church large. And so as I lift up the names of these churches and pastors and congregations, we, we hold them before you in prayer, Lord. We pray for Redeeming Grace Church here in Georgia. Or Pastor B.J. Walters and Pastor Brad Parker and the elders there. For Georgia United Methodist Church, Pastor Chole. For Ascension Catholic Parish, Father Har. For Milton United Church, Pastor Steve Seipke. For Trinity Presbyterian Church in St. Albans, uh, Pastor Seth Anderson. For Swanton Christian Church, Pastor Dan Bruckner. For Franklin United Church and East Franklin Church with Pastor Jason McConnell. For Church of the Rock, Pastor Mike Oldham, Marty Frederick, and Lisa Marie Thibault. For Northside Baptist Church, Pastor Dan Frost and Matt Biernett. And for First Baptist Church of Burlington, Pastor Karen Mendes. Lord, and other churches in Franklin County and in, in our region. Lord, we ask for your, um, for your hand to be upon these congregations as we do for ourselves. We pray that um, like, like gardens, each of these churches would be fruitful, that, that weeds would be plucked, that good fruit would grow, that um, they would yield a harvest of uh, people, who, um, uh, people who come to know you and are baptized and follow you, people who are sanctified and grow in their faith. Um, we pray that uh, each sermon preached, each lesson taught, each time of fellowship would, um, uh, would serve to uh, draw these people closer to you. We pray that you would keep us 
um, steadfast in proclaiming the gospel. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would bless pastors and their families, uh, protect them from the evil one, protect marriages, and also for all of the leaders in these churches, the, the, whether they're um, appointed leaders or lay leaders, that you would um, greatly empower them to serve in the ways you've called them. Lord, thank you that we are not alone, but there are so many churches in our area um, who follow Christ. And, and we pray just for greater unity for your body uh, in Georgia, in Franklin County, and beyond, um, that people who don't yet know you would just be amazed by the cooperation and the love that Christians have for one another. God, we pray during this divisive election season that you would protect our churches from division and discord uh, and that our allegiance to Christ would far outstrip uh, political um, values or desires. But Lord, it can be hard, so we pray for your help. So Lord, bless each of these churches, make your face shine upon them, strengthen them in, in the gospel and in good works. May they be effective, <clears throat> and may you bring many to know you through all of our ministries. We pray this in Jesus' name. And Lord, we also just, uh, thinking now of the many people um, uh, that we are uh, worried about this morning, uh, that we are concerned for, we pray, Lord, that you would um, meet people where they need to be met with your grace, with your help, with your healing. And we call to mind all the folks who are in our circles who, who really uh, need you and need help. And so, Lord, you know each one, and we trust you. We, we turn our worries into prayer now as we, as we ask you to help them. And now we pray the words that the Lord Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I know that the, uh, the teen Sunday school class talked about the Lord's Prayer in Sunday school this morning, so if you have any questions, ask them what it's all about, what they learned. Well, we have some announcements, starting with people to celebrate this week. Alexis, a person, no, no, three people. Technically three. They tell me I need to use this, so bear with me. Um, on Halloween Day, Annalyn Blow has a birthday, and Dave and Marie Bartlett have an anniversary. Since Annalyn's not here, we get to sing happy anniversary today to Dave and Marie. Right, teen night this Friday um, at from 6 to 8 at the Jimmy Center for all 7th through 12th graders and um, invite friends to that. Uh, I think they're always in need of more adult helpers. Um, Rebecca and Mike, are you involved in that right now? Not so much. K I know Kara's not here, so um, talk to Kara Bior if you want to help out with that. Or send an email to teennightgeorgiavt at gmail.com. We're making progress on our capital campaign to be able to pay for another section of brickwork this next summer. So 
um, invite you to continue to make donations to that as you are able. And then finally, uh, for the bulletin announcements, I want to challenge each person here to think of one way they may be called to serve during our worship service. Um, could you read scripture? Are you a child who could help with the offering? Or even adults can do that sometimes, Mike. Um, could you be a bell ringer? Could you, uh, maybe one of you who's a teen or older would be able to start working with Christian in the sound booth and the video? Um, it takes a lot of people to make things run smoothly on Sunday morning. So, uh, and usually if it doesn't run smoothly, smoothly that's because of me. <laughs> Um, but please think about that and see how God might be calling you to serve. Um, you might notice that it's not the first Sunday of the month, and yet the communion table is set this morning. And that's because, hopefully, as it will become clear, um, today in Mark, we're actually covering the story of the Last Supper. And the sermon will be a little different today, but I hope it'll become clear how um, it's really appropriate to actually celebrate the Lord's Supper as we look into the text about the Lord's Supper. So bonus, we get an additional chance to, uh, to enjoy communion together. Any other announcements? Okay, well then I'll invite the scripture reader forward and I uh, invite you to turn in your Bibles to Mark 14 or to look at the screen as we hear the story of the first communion. Twenty six in your pew Bibles if you want to follow along. I'm reading from Mark chapter 14, verses 12 to 31. On the first day of the festival of the unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house when he ent the house he enters, the teacher asks, Where is my guest room? Where am I to eat Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make pre preparations for us there. The disciples left and went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will be betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It, was one of the, it is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips his bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as... It is written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is the, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee, Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, 
you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. This is the word of God. Good morning, brothers and sisters. My name is Adam, Adam, or I guess as you say, Adam. I'm not the Adam from Genesis. I am just an ordinary Adam from Jerusalem. I'm sure you've never heard of me. Brother Mark didn't even write my name in his gospel. I was just the man carrying the jar of water. Just a footnote in the story. But there's more to it, I assure you. I see that you have a communion table set this morning with bread and wine, and I want to tell you, I, when I talk to people and they usually say, Angels above, you actually ate with Jesus on that last night? What was it like? Uh, Was it special? Well, I'll tell you, but I will also say this. Whoever drinks the bread and eats, drinks the wine and eats the bread in faith is closer to Jesus than I was on that night. So let me tell you my story and hopefully you'll see what I mean. That spring day, Jerusalem was on edge. The city was shoulder to shoulder with pilgrims coming in for the feast. You could hear sheep bleeding everywhere, bleating everywhere, with Roman soldiers on every corner and with all the rumors flying. Under the circumstances, we didn't even know if the teacher and his disciples would want to set foot in Jerusalem that day. But my father had offered our room for them knowing that the Passover can only be eaten inside the holy city. See, we we aren't rich, but a few years before, we had added an extra room onto the roof of our house for family gatherings and with friends and such like that. My father sent word to Jesus through the grapevine that this room was his if he so desired it. And he arranged a secret sign to let us know He said a man would be carrying a jar of water, that's me, his son, near the east gate of the city at noon. On my shoulder, doing what only women typically do, but the whole point was I had to stand out. And so, sure enough, around noon, two men come into the city and they see me and come over. And they say, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat my Passover? I said, follow me. They followed me through the crowd back to my father's house. I knocked on the door and introduced them. They introduced themselves as Peter and John. He led them up the stairs into the, 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 the upstairs room, and, and they saw how it was all furnished with carpets and pillows and a table and lamps on the wall, and they looked so relieved. And then we got to work getting everything ready. My father took the lamb to the temple to get slaughtered so that as soon as the sun set, we could begin roasting it. Peter and John helped me carry jars of wine up from the storeroom and then helped me fill the lamps with oil. My mother started baking the unleavened bread. And then I took Peter and John to the market to buy olives and bitter herbs and hyssop. And we got everything laid out on the table as it should be for like, any, like for any Passover. Everything was ready. Finally, well after dark, there was a knock at the door. And I opened it to see Jesus himself. I had never seen him this close up before. And I stammered my greeting, uh, made a fool of myself, but he just smiled and said, Brother, may we come in? I opened the door wide, and Jesus came in with the other ten disciples into that upper room. A few of our neighbors and family friends arrived who had also been uh, disciples of Jesus, who had listened to him and wanted to follow him. We all took our places in the room with Jesus and his 12 forming an inner circle around the table and the rest of us 
beyond. Now, I know most people think it was only Jesus and his 12 there that night, but it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. I kept looking at Jesus and thinking, could this really be true? Is Jesus himself eating under our roof at our table? What have we done to deserve this honor? So we began the Passover Seder. We told the familiar story of God rescuing our ancestors from Egypt, how they slaughtered the Passover lamb at twilight and spread its blood on the doorposts so that the destroying angel would pass over their homes and spare their firstborn sons. How we had to eat unleavened bread because God was going to deliver us in a hurry and we left in haste. We went through the whole story, but soon I realized this was not going to be an ordinary Passover. The way Jesus started talking and spinning the tale, it was as if he was now in the middle of it. And then he said something that sucked the air out of the room. He said in a clear voice, One of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. There was a gasp. Everyone looked around as, as if to ask, who, who could it be? Uh, uh, each one of the inner circle said, you don't mean me, do you? Even Judas, the gall he had, said that. I looked at my father and mother and friends thinking, could it be one of us? Were we destined to do such a horrible thing? Then Jesus said, it is one of the twelve, one who dips his bread in the bowl with me. I didn't know whether to feel relieved that my family was safe or to be upset at the thought of one of Jesus' closest friends doing such a horrible thing. As we listened, Jesus went on and said, the Son of Man will go just as it has been written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. A chill shot up my spine. The room was dead silent. This is the point where I was sure Jesus would get up and point an accusing finger at his betrayer or pronounce a curse upon him. But he did not. I, I looked at Jesus' face expecting to see rage or fear, but I did not. Instead, I saw only grief. He did not ask for pity or beg for protection. He simply continued on with the Passover as if this, more than anything, was what needed to be done. Well, friends, when it came time in the Seder to eat the bread, Jesus picked up a loaf and he he gave thanks to it. He said, just as my father had on countless occasions, blessed art thou, O Lord our God, king of the world, who brings forth bread from the earth. And then he broke the bread into pieces, enough for everyone in the room, and put, put them in a basket and passed them around to us and said, take and eat. And then he said something that I will never forget. This is my body. I know, I know, you've all grown accustomed to hearing those words, uh, but let me tell you, on that first night, they were a riddle to me. Even the twelve looked confused. We proceeded with the rest of the food for the Passover, the, the meat, the bitter herbs, the stewed beans, but I was still trying to make sense of what Jesus had said. Then Jesus poured wine into a cup, he gave thanks to God for the fruit of the vine and he passed the cup around for all to drink. His inner circle, and then my father and mother and then our friends and then me. And while the, the tart, sweet flavor was still on my tongue, Jesus said something that was even more surprising. He said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. This was truly shocking. Uh, 
as a Jew, I would never dream of eating, uh, drinking an animal's blood, much less a man's blood. What could it mean? And yet, here was Jesus calling the wine in our mouths his very blood. My father cleared his throat like he always does when he's embarrassed. I'm sure that you do understand what he meant. You've read what Brother Matthew and Luke and Paul and others have written about this. But that night, the meaning was hidden from me. After we drank the wine, Jesus made a vow. He said, Truly, I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. I looked at Peter and saw a furrowed brow. He didn't like his master speaking this way. But then it hit me like a ton of stone. Jesus was talking about his death. We're, we're talking about his body being broken, his blood poured out, someone betraying him, and now making a, a vow that he would not drink again until the thing was finished. I know it's so obvious looking back, but at that time it was a startling revelation to me. Before I knew it, we were singing the final Hallel Psalms and Jesus and his disciples left. And I suppose Judas had slipped out of the meal early to do what he was going to do. We've all heard the story of what happened next, how Jesus and his disciples crossed the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives, how Jesus predicted that all of his disciples would fall away, how Peter swore up and down that he would die before denying Jesus. And all the others said the same. And they would live to eat those words for sure. But of course, I wasn't there. I was at home clearing the table, washing the dishes, sweeping the floor. I picked a scrap of bread up and held it in my hand, puzzled over what Jesus could mean by those strange words, this is my body. I poured the extra wine back into the jars and replayed those words again and again. This is my blood of the covenant poured out for many. I went to bed, but I didn't sleep. I just tossed and turned all night. Finally, after the neighbor's rooster crowed, I, I got up, I put on my sandals, I splashed water on my face and headed out into the street. It was a cold morning. I could hear some commotion happening up the hill at the temple complex, so I started running that way. And as I got closer, I saw a large crowd gathered. I went up to a woman at the back of the crowd and said, what's going on? And she said, Jesus of Nazareth is on trial for blasphemy. I climbed up onto the base of a column to get a better view and saw there on the stone steps was the man who had been in my house last night. He was bloody and naked. There was a, the Roman governor pointing at him and saying something to the crowd, and the crowd all started chanting something, which became louder and louder, and I realized they were saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Even the woman next to me started saying it. I was appalled. I don't really want to talk about what happened next. I did see them lead Jesus away as a condemned man. I went to tell my parents what was happening. By the time we got back, I saw from a distance that they had done the evil thing. Jesus was up on a cross along with two poor souls. Tears filled my eyes. I hung my head went away confused and sorrowful. At this point, friends, I need to spin my tail more quickly. I could tell a hundred stories about what happened next. The mournful Sabbath day, and then the first day of the week when the women found the tomb empty, and so on and so on. But let me skip ahead. About a, a new moon later, I chanced to meet the disciple Peter one day coming out of the temple. He said with a wink, young man, where's your jar of water? 
And then he embraced me and said, Brother, have you eaten the afternoon meal yet? I shook my head. So he said, follow me. Uh, I followed him down several narrow alleys to a small house where he knocked on the door. A young girl opened it, and I looked inside to see scores of men, women, and children uh, gathered in this room. In the center was a table with some bread and some wine and some other food laid out. And after introducing me to the group, Peter said, Brothers and sisters, let us break bread together in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter took his place at the table. He took a loaf, held it up, and broke it in half. This is the body of Christ broken for us, he said. Let us eat to remember his life given for ours. There were murmurings of amen and hallelujah. The loaf was passed around the room as each person took a piece and chewed it slowly. Some had tears in their eyes. Peter then lifted up a cup of wine, saying, Let us drink wine to remember the blood of our worthy Lord poured out as a sacrifice for many unworthy ones such as ourselves. It was then, it was then that a key turned in the lock of my mind. How could I have missed it? Jesus was the Passover lamb given for our salvation. His blood was the seal of the new covenant prophesied long ago. And as I looked around the room, seeing the cup passed from person to person, man to woman, I saw ordinary people like me. Not people who had kept the Torah perfectly, not people with power and status. I thought back to that night in my own home where Jesus was surrounded by people who would betray him and forsake him in his hour of need. Even Peter, whose failure was infamous. Then I thought of my own failures and sins. But Jesus gave his life even for people like me. He died so I could live. As the cup was passed around, each person drank. And as we did so, my heart was strangely warmed. My spirit discerned Jesus there in our midst, giving himself to us. I felt closer to Jesus then than I had that night in my own home, at, our, at my own table. Just as Jesus had knocked and I opened the door that night, I saw him now at the doorway of my heart, smiling and asking to come in. I said yes. Amen. Well, friends, we have a chance now to partake of the Lord's Supper and to, um, to eat and drink to remember what Jesus did. As I thought about this passage this week and wrote this story, um, uh, I was reflecting on the fact that Jesus, um, Jesus gave us this meal so that we could regularly be close to him in a very special way. I've heard it said that um, the Lord's Supper is the closest we get to Jesus on this side of heaven. Not because the bread and the juice in themselves have some power, but because Jesus has promised that when we eat and drink in faith, this is the point of contact between us and his death on the cross and all that that accomplished for us. Uh, forgiveness of sin, uh, healing, sanctification, um, the, the destruction of our shame and guilt, 
And so as we come this morning, I want to invite you to fully enter into this time. Christians throughout the ages have affirmed that at the Lord's Supper, Jesus, in a sense, is really present here. We do this to remember, but not simply a remembering like just thinking about something a long time ago, but remembering and recognizing Jesus in our midst. So if you know your need for God's grace, if you say yes to Jesus, uh, letting him, acknowledging his sacrifice on the cross for you, this table is open. You don't have to be a member of this church. Uh, it's Jesus' table laid for us. Um, rather than the, the deacons serving this time, I'm going to have people come down the center and take a cup and a piece of bread and then return to your seats. And once we've all returned, uh, we'll eat and drink together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for, uh, we thank you for your presence here among us. We thank you that um, 2,000 years ago when you gave yourself for us on the cross, that, that the benefits of that um, atonement are still as fresh as they were then. So Lord, we reflect on our own sin and on our own need for you. We thank you for your grace. And we pray that as we eat and drink, um, uh, in the words of the old prayer, we would feast on you in our hearts by faith. So Lord, come and fill this time. Bless this, this bread and this wine, this juice, to become for us uh, true symbols of your body and blood. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You've heard the story that night Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. And in the same way, he took a cup of wine and said, This cup is is a new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it in remembrance of me. I invite you now to come forward and to take the juice and the bread, return to your seats. If anyone needs a gluten-free option, those are in these small chalices here.
the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for us. blood of Jesus for the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins shed for us. You heard when Jesus said in that reading in Mark he would not drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when he drinks it anew. Imagine what that will be like when we get to actually eat and drink with Jesus at what Revelation calls the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so we live between the cross and the second coming. So may our faith be um, uh, stoked and encouraged as we continue to wait for Jesus and live faithfully for Him now. We're going to sing a song together now that reminds us uh, about that last coming day. We will feast in the house of Zion. Please uh, stand if you're able as we sing this. Yeah. 
of Zion, we will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things, we will say together, we will feast and weep no more. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve. There's also some wonderful food in the vestry if anyone wants to stay. Oh.